So thank you very much for, for having me present here. I'm really pleased to talk about um, our guide that we put together. So this talk is called Return to Work in Mental Health, Canadian Return to Work Coordinators Accounts of Challenges and Practical Strategies. So I'll explain all about what I mean by Canadian Return to Work Coordinators and so on and so forth. Um, so this is research that I did um, at the University of Waterloo with my co-authors, Elena Niederman, Katja McKnight, Cindy Malakowski and Megan Crouch. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that this um, research was funded by the WSIB grants program and was conducted between 2018 and 2020. So this is the Workplace Safety and Insurance Board in Ontario that has competitive grants that, we, that then we were awarded uh, one of them to conduct independent research. Um, we had a stakeholder advisory committee that played a very important role in this research, um, helping us at the very beginning thinking about uh, this research project, um, thinking about our emerging results as they came out, and especially at the end, thinking through what the key messages were and how to develop this guide that I'm about to present to you. So you can see here that we had um, contributions from the Ontario Network of Injured Worker Groups, Workplace Safety and Insurance Board, um, from consultants such as Goen Consulting and Homewood Health, from Labour Union, the Ontario Public Service Employees Union, insurers, Manulife, as well as um, Human Resources Professional Association um, consultants. So we had quite a quite a wide, um, diverse group who were very very strongly engaged in the study. So. Before I go any further, I'd like to talk about fitting mental health into return to work. So for any of you who are listening right now, if your main field is return to work, you'll know that return to work has, has tended to focus mostly on physical injury. Um, and so, you know, the, it'll be how, how much can you lift, right? So when you're designing work accommodations, there's a functional abilities form that actually in our jurisdiction in Ontario asks, you know, can, how, how much weight can you lift? It's really not very well suited to mental health. Um, and it's also return to work tends to um, um, be focused on acute conditions rather than ongoing. So the idea is that we're going to give you some modified work, some accommodations, and then you're going to be better and get back to what you used to do. That also doesn't always fit very well with mental health. That can be ongoing chronic condition. Um, and so fitting, fitting mental health into return to work has been a little bit awkward. There have been some, some great uh, researchers doing research. You just heard from Louisine Delno, who's, who's big in this area. We have um, Carolyn Dua, um, who, who, present, who recently published this Employer Best Practices Guidelines Systematic Review. Mark Corbier out of Quebec does a lot of work on return to work and mental health. And then we have Kurdosi, who, who published recently in the Journal of Occupational Rehabilitation. This is just a very small selection. There is, so just to acknowledge, there's definitely an emerging literature on mental health and return to work, but it's, it's, it's secondary to the huge literature on physical health and return to work. A key aspect of return to work is that it's a complex terrain with many stakeholders. Um, you have the worker, uh, you have the insurers, you have the workplace parties, the managers, the co-workers, you can often have union representatives and healthcare providers and you could have you know, several of those. Um, when return to work coordinators are trying to coordinate return to work, they're often at the center of this trying to coordinate and interact with all of these parties. So it is a very complex terrain and return to work coordinators occupy uh, an interesting position in this terrain. It's important to recognize and, and, and Louise mentioned this in her presentation also, that there are different interests and stakes um, present in return to work. It's, it's not a neutral playing field. The different stakeholders can have different investments different interests, different organizational goals. And the ideal in return to work is often to have collaborative problem solving. Let's all try to be on the same page. 
Um, so that's the ideal. Uh, it's, it's not always easy to get there, um, but that's the, the, what return to work is based on. So the focus for our study um, was to tap the frontline insight of return to work coordinators. So you saw that picture I showed with all of the different players and the location of return to work coordinators. And the idea here is that they have distinct frontline knowledge uh, of return to work. And so the main research question was what are the actual challenges related to return to work for people with common mental health conditions? and how to return to our coordinators and manage them. We conducted a qualitative study. Um, as I mentioned, the objective was to tap their rich frontline experience of supporting return to work for clients with common mental health disorders. And our mandate with this project was to create a strategies guide to be used by stakeholders. And that's what I'll be presenting to you as well in this presentation. A lot of people have asked what we mean by return to work coordinators and certainly um, a lot of people are involved with return to work that don't have that as an official title. So what we asked is, do you manage return to work as a part of your professional role? If the answer was yes, then we included them. Um, we talked to people from across Canada. In our sample, we had people who, who were managing return to work in-house for a large organization usually. Uh, there were people who worked for um, consulting firms. They were third-party consultants that sold their return to work services to small businesses or large. Um, there were people at workers' compensation and private insurance companies. And we also talked to people involved with return to work in unions. Um, that was really important to us because we knew that they would add a, a, a particular perspective. And our focus was on common mental health experience, such as depression, anxiety and addictions we there's a lot of actually there's a lot of quite a bit of return to work research out there on the more severe uh, mental health conditions and return to work and we wanted to focus on the the common mental health we conducted a total of 47 semi-structured in-depth interviews in 2018 each interview was approximately an hour in length some a little bit more some some shorter um, and uh, every interview is transcribed verbatim um, the people we spoke to um, all had experience of, of managing uh, return to work for people with mental health conditions and also other health conditions. Our thematic analysis led to the identification of challenges and strategies for managing mental health cases in three key contexts. Uh, there's the work context that involves workplace parties, the health context that considers health and health care, and then the claims context, and that's the overall communication context about managing the absence of a claim. And this is, this is what we came up with. These are the problems and strategies for managing mental health cases. So here you can see that a picture of the cover of our guide that's called Roadblocks and Alternate Routes, Practical Strategies for Managing Mental Health and Return to Work. So the roadblocks are our problems that that which are the people in our study identified as preventing successful return to work alternate strategies were all of the different possible ways of managing these so the content in this guide was created by these interviews that i described in our study we went on to develop this guide um, and it was validated at two different return to work coordinator workshops The target audience for the guide is broad. Although we generated this guide based on return to work coordinators interviews, um, the idea is that this, the, what's in the guide is useful to quite a variety of, of different players, including employers, workers, union representatives, workers' compensation staff, healthcare providers, human resources professionals, insurers, legal representatives, and injured workers. And the goal of the guide is to help facilitators, any of these facilitators, to recognize complex issues related to return to work for individuals with mental health conditions and to provide the experienced return to work coordinator strategies for supporting the optimal return to work for workers with common mental health conditions. Before I go any further, I want to share the guides guiding concepts with you. And this was something that 
um, came out near the end of the study as we were having uh, discussions with our stakeholder advisory committee and we felt that it was important to pull out some of these values that we realized after putting the whole guide together were actually guiding you know the the, the concept of the guide um, and it's basically that unique challenges uh, and opportunities exist with return to work and mental health um, a challenge is that the the concept of objective medical evidence is difficult to apply um, this is something that's more common with, with, with physical health conditions where you might want to have an MRI or an X-ray, um, this sort of objective medical evidence. But with mental health, there are aspects of people's minds and, and lives that are difficult to measure. Um, and it's important keep, to keep in mind that DSM diagnoses are made through clinician interpretation of self-report instruments. In return to work, there's often a very strong focus on functional abilities, but this may not always be possible when dealing with people with mental health conditions. For instance, it's possible to be seriously ill even when not presenting as sick. So for instance, people might expect someone when they're ill to be lethargic and to not have a lot of energy, but it's possible to be quite, quite ill with mental health condition and to be engaged in intense social and physical activity. As well, people with the same diagnosis may display symptoms differently. So this brings us to the bottom line uh, of the key strategies in this guide are about listening to the worker and understanding their work context. Here is a, a, a picture of um, the page that shows the layout of the guide. We have a digital version as well as a a coil bound uh, print version. So you can see here that we have the three contexts, the work, health and claims context. And, and in the print version, we have the three tabs that you can see on the right hand side where you can just flip to one context or the other. Um, for each of these contexts, we have a table of contents. So for instance, um, here's the table of contents for the work context. You can see we start off with some vignettes just to just to show scenarios of situations and i'll show you a vignette in a moment and then we go into different roadblocks that were identified through this research study so for instance in the work context roadblocks included workplace mental health literacy uh, interpersonal workplace relationships uh, workplace communication during sick leave workplace supportive accommodations employers' understandings of recovery timelines, workers' concerns about return to work, the fit of accommodations, workplace flexibility, health problems after return to work, and psychological health of the workplace. And so we have a table of contents similar to this for the health context and the claim context as well, addressing uh, issues in those domains. So every section begins with a few different vignettes. Um, and here is an example of a vignette in the work context. And you can see we have a title, we have the vignette. On the left-hand side, we have the roadblocks that you can see occurring in this vignette. On the right-hand side, we have some alternate routes that could be considered. So I'll just read through this vignette just to give you an example of one of the vignettes in this, in this guide. So this is difficult workplace departure and concerns about return to work, May's story. So May used to be the social butterfly of the office. So several colleagues took notice when she stopped planning social gatherings and avoided opportunities to converse with coworkers altogether. After an outburst at work with a colleague, May took sick leave. But before she left, she'd been showing up late for work and often left team members to finish up her work at the last minute before presentations to potential clients. Although a few of her good friends had initially defended her behavior and said she was going through a tough time with family, when she failed to return their calls of concern, they stopped trying altogether. During the four weeks that May was away from work, no colleagues called to see how she was doing. In return to work planning meetings, May worried about coming back to work because she feared the judgment and the fallout of her past behavior. She was nervous about seeing her colleagues and did not know what to tell them, and that only compounded her anxiety. 
So you can see there are a couple of roadblocks that related to this that we have in the guide. One relates to interpersonal workplace relationships. Another relates to workplace communication during sick leave. And then a few, there's a variety of different, um, for each one, you'll see that for each of the roadblocks, we have, you know, three to 10 different alternate routes, but just three of the alternate routes here is, for instance, <clears throat> asking coworkers about the best contact approach while they're away, talking with the worker about concerns and needs, and including the worker in return to work planning. So every section contains specific roadblocks, each with alternate routes. So you can see from the previous slide, we had one of the roadblocks here, which was interpersonal workplace relationships. And this is what it looks like in the guide. We have the problem at the top and then the alternate routes down here. So for the case of interpersonal workplace relationships, we say here, workplace absences for workers with mental health conditions may be preceded by a period of poor work performance. Workers who feel that they perform poorly may be apprehensive about returning to work out of fear of being stigmatized or due to unresolved interpersonal issues with their supervisor or other workplace parties. As a result, even if a worker appears medically ready to return to work, they may resist returning and after a return may feel uncomfortable with their situation. And so the, there's various alternate routes. And I, I put, you know, for this version, for this presentation, I've just highlighted some key words here. But for instance, <clears throat> talk with the worker about their concerns and needs. Um, look into the pre-sick leave departure situation and any result issues. Um, explain to coworkers that people need workplace support and, to, and it's important for them to be engaged in workplace activities. So this is, this is just an example of one of the roadblocks and the alternate routes. What I'd like to do now is to um, discuss selected roadblocks from each section of the guide, just to give you a sense of what's in the guide. And so, for instance, in the workplace context, um, three of the roadblocks are work, workplace mental health literacy, interpersonal workplace relations, and employers' understandings of recovery timelines. So <clears throat> with respect to workplace mental health literacy, the issue here is that before a worker um, leaves uh, when developing mental health problem, the performance may be inconsistent uh, or not what it was before. And it's possible that people in the workplace, including the supervisors, may, may simply assume that the worker has lost their interest in this work. It's just not motivated to do well in this job anymore. So, so this roadblock addresses workplace parties and the challenges that they have sometimes understanding um, what, what mental health is. Interpersonal workplace relationships, I've just gone through that roadblock with you. Um, but it's, it's, it's about the difficulty of, of a worker returning when their departure um, had been accompanied by uh, some challenging personal interactions. And then a third example of a roadblock in the workplace context is the employer's understanding of recovery timelines. Um, the the uh, return to work coordinators in our study just talked a lot about how employers could become very impatient about the time it might take someone to recover. Um, and they could have challenging encounters with employers about this. And so, um, this, the alternate routes here are, are, are focused on um, um, uh, educating employers about trajectories and timelines for return to work and mental health. And this is just a sample of some alternate routes. They're not directly mapped onto the roadblocks that I just described, but just to give you a sense of some alternate routes that are brought forward in the work context, including asking the worker about their accommodation needs, providing tailored and detailed accommodation information to the worker and checking in regularly. And a lot of this is, is echoes of what you just heard from Louis St. Arnaud's presentation, including worker representatives, if possible, in accommodation planning, being flexible and understanding when encountering roadblocks, and educating workplace parties about a healthy working environment. Um, in the health context, just three of the 
of the roadblocks that I'm pulling out for the purposes of this presentation are content of sick notes, quality of medical evidence, and worker engagement with mental health care. So content of sick notes is an issue that came up a lot. You may have a healthcare provider who provides a very brief um, sick note for the worker that doesn't really explain very much while at the same time recommending an ex quite an extended period of time off. Um, the challenge with that is that it doesn't give other people involved with return to work very much to go on in terms of where to start planning and, 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 and um, how accommodation might proceed. So the advice here is about you know, how, how to ask for um, sick notes that provide enough information. Quality of medical evidence is another issue that comes up. Um, there may be uh, multiple healthcare provider reports in the case of, of someone who's on a mental health leave, and they might all seem to be contradictory. Although it might just be the way that the healthcare providers are communicating and the vocabulary that is contradicting rather than the actual views of what the situation is. But there could be situations where a DSM diagnosis is, is not provided. And all of these can add up to insurers not supporting a claim. And so you have someone who is ill, who needs support, um, but the paperwork isn't going very well and their claim is not approved, which makes things even more difficult. So, so there's some, um, we talk about how to manage that situation. And then the third example is employ worker engagement with mental health care. Um, mental health is a very stigmatizing situation um, and a lot of injuries uh, have, uh, can have mental and physical health combined. For instance, uh, we, in, we, it, it's not uncommon to have a physical health problem and then to have mental health follow that. Um, and workers may not want to engage with the mental health side of it. They may be focusing on the physical. Um, and so this, uh, because of, they want to avoid the stigma um, of, associated with mental health conditions. And so this is a roadblock where we talk about how to, how to talk about mental health, how to make people feel more comfortable about mental health. And just some general alternate routes related to health costs or listening to workers' description of their needs, including their triggers or exposure. Um, providing healthcare providers with a proposed job accommodation plan so the worker could go to their healthcare provider with something from the workplace that gives the healthcare provider something to work with. Um, encouraging the maintenance of healthcare supports during the return to work period. Um, Often it may be that a worker returns to work when they feel better, and that might be when they're ending their medication use or ending their counseling. Um, and yet when return to work begins, some new challenges can come back again. And so um, there was a lot of talk about just extending healthcare supports at least during the initial return to work period. And then considering ways to manage healthcare, financial and accessibility issues. And this is the challenge where um, it can take a very long time to see a mental health specialist, such as a psychiatrist, because of waiting lists. Yet at the same time, in, in most jurisdictions in Canada, if you want to have other types of support, such as psychological, um, there's a cost to it. And so the um, advice in, in this one is about how to try to look at the bigger picture and see if, for instance, the work organization might want to help with this financial issue. <clears throat> um, clean context. Three that we're pulling out in the clean context are the complexity of mental health cases, difficult decisions, and health information for adequate case management. So, Complexity of mental health cases came up a lot. Um, the return to work coordinators talked about how um, managing a mental health return to work required a lot of time and energy relative to uh, what they call usual return to work, which would be physical. Workers may need more time to explain their situation. They may require more frequent communication. Meanwhile, the people who are managing the cases have have their caseloads to manage and, and they, have, they struggle to find the time to allocate to this person for their return to work needs. And so we have some suggestions about reorganizing caseloads and communicating to manage those issues. Another issue that came up was difficult decisions. Um, if you're uh, a return, involved with return to work, 
You may be involved with difficult and stressful conversations with workers and other parties. For instance, decisions um, by, that the workplace or insurer will no longer provide income support benefits, or that the worker may be returning to accommodated work, but to a different job and not to their previous position that they prefer to return to. Um, there can be a lot of intense emotions in these situations. And so um, that, that was a roadblock that was raised and there were some alternate routes that were proposed for how to work through that. A third, a third is health information for adequate case management. And here we have um, the issue of privacy. Um, workers are entitled to privacy about their health and they do not need to disclose their diagnosis to people involved with return to work. Um, some people involved with return to work might feel that they need more health information to properly manage this work as return to work. We, we provide uh, quite a number of suggestions for how they can manage return to work without, without accessing this information that may be private to the worker. And just some general alternate routes in the claim context. Once again, ask the worker what's working for them and what might work better. Engage with the involved parties as early as possible to develop a common plan. Facilitate communication among different parties with standard templates. So even if everyone had the same categories that they had to think about, that could, might help bring everyone together to work in the same direction. And finally, if possible, have in-person meetings for complex conversations. We were surprised in our study at how many return to work coordinators did their work entirely by telephone. And we understand that there are geographic constraints, but um, the, the ones who did have uh, in-person meetings with their clients talked about the value of that as well, especially in complex situations. So um, if you're interested in the guide, this is where to download it uh, in that uh, hyperlink highlighted in yellow. We also have some bound hard copies available. So if you're interested in accessing those, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and I would just like to thank you and, and um, say I look forward to any of your questions. Thank you.